Welcome to the Everyday Veteran Podcast. I'm Pat Keplinger, Marine Veteran. The purpose of this podcast and the mission of it is to educate, motivate, and inspire you and your families to live your best life post-military service. Joining me tonight is my co-host. I have Marine Veteran Blake Weller. Blake, welcome. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate you. Yep. Happy yep. To be here. Good to see you again. You too. And tonight we're going to be interviewing a special guest, Marine Veteran Jason Grabowski. And so Jason is is one of those guys that, that I served with, um, and he probably was one of the smartest guys I've ever met my entire life. Uh, he's got a huge heart, big smile, um, and super funny. And so i um, just honored to have him here tonight. So Jason, welcome. Great. Thanks, Blake. Thanks, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here. Good to have you. So where are you joining us from tonight? So I'm living right outside of Riverview, Florida. So it was a uh, 89 degrees today. I know it's tough because February, but uh, we're we're struggling down this way here to to stay warm. <laughs> yeah. Blake's in in Arkansas. Blake, Blake how's the weather out there? It's pretty crazy, a little, right? A little chilly today. A little chilly. Tornadoes tomorrow. What's that? Uh, tornadoes tomorrow. You know, snow the next day. It's a good time here. Had some crazy hail and some lightning, right? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely missed that California weather, and uh, I'm I'm envious of you, Jason, down there in Florida, man. Oh. <laughs> well, welcome again. Thanks so much, Jason, for being here. Why don't you start your story off by telling us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and and where you grew up, and and then kind of your journey into the military. Perfect. Yep. So, uh, like I said, Jason Grabowski. Born in uh, 1975, back up in a small town in Connecticut. And really had envisioned my life at that, just growing up in Watertown, Connecticut. I kind of figured I was going to stay there for my entire life. My my parents are from that area. All my friends kind of stayed in that area. But uh, as I progressed through high school years, kind of ran into discipline issues, we'll call it, where I just kind of didn't do anything, didn't do homework didn't study for tests and uh, really started struggling to actually finish high school. And in my house, I grew up with a stepdad that was a, a Vietnam vet infantry side. So he had seen his fair share of stuff, never talked about it, but he definitely had some baggage from that. And he was trying to teach me discipline. I was resistant to discipline. And uh, somewhere along the way of my high school or senior year in high school, he decided to, to kind of give me the boot in March of my senior year. And I packed my bags, moved down to Florida, and that's where I started to kind of meet real life. And I was living with my aunt down there, but I was paying rent and started working two jobs. Started doing the Cracker Barrel for closing shift, and I found a McDonald's job for an opening shift. But I'm still in high school at this point here, but I'm 18, and so there's nobody really pushing me to even finish high school. So I ended up failing out of high school, working my two jobs. And my life is pretty much going nowhere pretty quick. And one of the guys that I worked at Cracker Barrel with, he was joining the Navy. So I had never envisioned being a military guy, regardless of the service, let alone the Marine Corps. I never had even, not, not even a, an, an idea in my head to join the Marine Corps. But I went down to the Navy recruiter with him, chatted with the Navy recruiter a little bit, and uh, it just it just didn't really kind of feel like my my, my, my gig. But when I came out of the recruiting office, they're standing outside of the the Marine Corps recruiting office. All four offices were were co-located. was a gunnery sergeant, St. Romain. I had no desire to talk to him, no desire to even look at the Marine Corps. I did not want to take the path of the most resistance. I was looking for like an an easy path, you know, something to get out of of Dodge down there and and make my life actually go into a, a, a better direction. And as I was talking with gunnery sergeant, St. Romain, you know, he had kind of talked about my future a little bit and just made a simple deal with me and said, just watch this video. And if if you like the video, we can talk more. If you don't like the video, then you're free to go. And I said, fair enough. And I was you know, 18 years old, so I didn't really have that big of a backbone at that time. So I was easily swayed to come into the office and watch the video. And it's a professional marketing video at the end of the day. And it, and it had me hooked. And uh, it sold the, the, the camaraderie. It's It sold the tough path, the, the, the pride. And I basically decided that day that I was joining the Marine Corps. 
I went back home, told my family that I was doing this, but I had not graduated high school yet. So I talked to the, the gunny about this whole ordeal of where I was at. I was already done with high school, but I was technically enrolled in an adult high school program down in uh, Benel, Florida. And he had gone down there and worked it so that I got on an expedited track. And I'm going to leave it at that, an expedited track to finish my high school diploma. And probably within about four weeks, I was done. And I was shipping off to boot camp in January of 1994. And that began my journey that really shaped the person that I became and uh, that I am today. I joined the Marine Corps as an open contract. I had lost, I was supposed to join as avionics. And as I was going to boot camp, I had done some stuff that I probably shouldn't have done while I was in my path of waywardness and ended up getting a, a waiver and had lost my entire contract and came in full open contract. But I was, I was still dead set. No matter what my contract was, I was going to be a Marine. And ended up getting 2800, which uh, which is communications electronics repair, and went to 29 Palms, California after boot camp. The armpit of the Marine Corps, you know, it's uh, it's a uh, it's close to Palm Springs, but it's really not, especially when you're a PFC private that uh, doesn't have a car. And spent about a year out there, and um, ended up going to Okinawa right after that. I did not want to go to Okinawa. I went kicking and scratching. I wanted to stay in the U.S. Did not want to go through all the shot exercises. To, uh, to go over there, they, they pitched like 20 shots you had to get. And I was scared of needles back in those days. It's kind of funny to even think back to that fact, but uh, had to go through the overseas screening. And then I, I went to 7th Com Battalion over on Camp Hansen in Okinawa. And actually the plaque that is right there is the plaque that I got from 7th Com. I ended up loving it so much over there. I spent four years and on the, on the writing of that plaque, it actually talks about being chased down the streets of Camp Hansen by two little white dogs because I had befriended these dogs and I used to feed them. And I, by the time I reached Sergeant over there, I had my own room. I was at the end of the hallway. So I was able to, to go out into the stairwell whenever I wanted to. And, and it had the privileges of a Sergeant in the barracks. It was, it was great, but I would feed these dogs and they got to know the sound of my car coming down the street of Camp Hansen. So if I was coming back, the two dogs would literally run out chase my car down the street and bark the whole way. So it was, uh, it was really cool. But uh, it, getting sent to Okinawa was a great experience. I, I went, like I said, res I was resistant to it, but it was probably my, my funnest tour that I did as a, uh, as a com guy prior to, you know, I enjoyed the war stuff too, but uh, that, was, that was a cool experience. Tried to stay in Okinawa forever. Got sent back home. Lat moved to tech control, you know, communication specialist type stuff, just to go back to Okinawa. Went back there and uh, spent one year and realized that it wasn't for me anymore. Came back to the U.S. to, to Camp Pendleton and uh, just continued to do communications for the Marine Corps through uh, through 2015. So, so you retired in 2015? Yeah, we spent 21 and a half years and uh, punched out in 2015 and found my uh, my second life at that point. How was boot camp for you? I I know that you're uh you're you've got a pretty tall, slender build, so I, I'm guessing it wasn't too difficult for you. How was it for you though? Otherwise, the the mind games. Yeah, the mind game was definitely the I think a challenge for everybody. But I was six foot two. I went in the in the boot camp weighing 138 pounds, so I was right at that crest of being at the at the minimum, which at, at that day and age was 139 for my height. So because I was so tall. I was actually right behind the squad leaders. So whenever we went to the chow hall and formed for chow, I was like one of the first ones to get into line. So I ended up putting on about 35 pounds in boot camp, and it was all due to yogurts and bananas because there were so many of those on, still in the mess hall that uh, I got my usual chow, but then I had the opportunity to have like two more yogurts. So I put on a lot of weight there, but I, I think at the end of the day, everybody looks back at your memory of boot camp that that it was kind of fun, but when you're there, it's it's a miserable experience no matter what. I don't think anybody really enjoys it, but uh, yeah, you get through it for three months and then it bonds us forever. Was there anybody that you went to boot camp with that you served, um, you know, throughout your Marine Corps career? In the beginning, there were, I think the first four years, there were a few guys that, uh, that I served with that became 2800s, but uh, they didn't stick around. And, you know, the majority of people do one or two tours in the four or eight years, and uh, and they punch on to do bigger and better things. I I kind of just I just found my my 
my rut, so to speak. And I'll talk about that after as to how I turned to 21 years, but it never intended to be 21 years. I, I intended to get out at one point. Yeah. What, what was the hardest part of like, um, the military lifestyle for you? You said you wanted to go to like the easiest path, but then you ended up joining one of the hardest paths. So what, what was that like for you? And what was the, what was the hardest part for you to adapt to the military lifestyle? So the, the pride piece of being a Marine and, and owning the title, I think that really is what, what called me to it. And, and to this day, I think it's what bonds me to, to, to my core group of friends that are all former Marines or retired Marines. But I, I think the, the, the hardest part of my Marine Corps journey was coming out of my, my comfort zone. I was always a shy kid when I was growing up. I would never be able to do this back in, in, in my younger years as far as be comfortable in a public setting. Even today at, at, in, my, in my day job, I'm very comfortable talking to groups and the Marine Corps really forced me to come out of my comfort zone because they do that at, at the end of the day, you come in as a private, you've got no responsibility whatsoever. You just have to be where they tell you to be and do what they tell you to do. And as you move up the chain, you end up having to start to think for yourself a little bit. You, you're the one making the policies at some point. And then you're the one that's got to correct bad behavior. You're the one that has to have those difficult conversations with the Marines that, that maybe had gone wayward. They were, they were taking my path at one point. But you, you quickly learn that you're accountable for the mission. And somewhere in that path, that, that it, it pulled me out of my comfort zone. But that growing journey was very painful. And it didn't occur. Until well after I was what I'd call kind of a, a leader of Marines, it, you know, pinning on warrant officer was probably when I started really getting forced to come out of my comfort zone. Even as a senior enlisted guy, I picked up gunny before I became a warrant officer, and I was still a shy kid that uh, that really had a difficult time correcting junior Marines. As, as an E seven, I look back and I'm like, I should have been had no problems correcting wayward behavior, but uh, but I was just a shy guy that had no backbone at that time. So that that was probably the toughest part of my journey is getting that backbone, coming out of my, my comfort zone and, uh, and, and, and really just being a leader. So 29 Palms, Blake, Blake knows a little bit about 29 Palms and, and, and being stationed at 29 Palms pretty much of a. Yeah, that's a, that's a miserable place. I, it, the, I know that the comm school for the, the enlisted is in 29 Palms. Then they moved the warrant officer piece out there too. So now if you become a warrant officer instructor, you're, you're stuck out there. I, I avoided 29 Palms like the plague. And uh, they tried to make me an instructor when I finished tech on school there. But uh, I managed to get, to get out of Dodge. I'm sure people love it there. I don't know why. But uh, yeah, armpit of the Marine Corps is what I consider it. So they're sending the lieutenant commos out there too. That's where, that's where they go to school as well. So all of the comm Marines are going out of 29 Palms now. Wow, that's a breaking in period right there. <laughs> yep, yep. So, um, seventh seventh com battalion. When you were there, did you go on any exercises and get to travel around uh, Asia or get to travel around anywhere else while you're there? So, for the four years that I was there, I had really envisioned doing that. I, you know, once I got there, and seventh com had Mews that went out there, and you know, thirty first Mew did a lot of good pumps out there, but. Even though I was a telephone guy, what actually ended up happening was I had finished just just high enough in my class that I became a 2813. So in the way that they racked 20, the, the telephone guys, if you finished high in the class, you got sent to Biloxi, Mississippi for, they called it the Tick 42 van. This is legacy gear. It doesn't even exist anymore. This massive green van that had 120 telephone lines coming out of it. So if you finished top, you went to that school. And like 10 out of the 18 of us went there. I didn't make the, the cut for that one. I was in the bottom half of the class. And like four or five of us went to Shepherd Air Force Base. So I was like two or three from the bottom of the class. I made the cut to go to, to Shepherd Air Force Base to become a 2813, which was a fiber optic cable splicer. When I got to open up, the people they brought on the deployments were the TIC-42 van techs, those 2822s. So I was the wrong job to go on a lot of those sexy tours, to go on news and stuff like that. But I did get the opportunity in my four-year stay there to go to Australia one time with Sevitcom. And then uh, that was really my only deployment with Sevitcom. After I became a tech controller, I went back for my one year. I did a couple other tours. I went to Thailand, and then I went back to Australia. So 
but for four years I had one deployment to Australia and that was it with the wrong MOS. Australia's not too bad of a place to go though. It's not if you're in the right area. They stuck us out in Shoalwater Bay training area north of Rockhampton and uh, I think I had Liberty in Rockhampton maybe once or twice. I don't remember having any good times out there. I just remember seeing a lot of kangaroos and wallabies and uh, and it was hot. <laughs> so I did it. I did. Um, was it Talisman Saber out in Australia? And um, so we were out of Rockhampton, but I was working with the Australian army. And so we were exercise controllers. And so we stayed in town. We didn't have to stay. Oh, man. Trying to think of it, the caves or something. There was some type of um, it was like a rodeo ground or something that uh, we were bivouacked, and the the people that I was with, the, the, with the, the Aussies, were like, "We're not sleeping in tents, and we're not sleeping out here." <laughs> so we got so that's why your experience was a lot better than mine. You were like, it's, it was great out there. I was like, I was in Northern Training Area, Showwater Bay. I'm not sure about the the greatness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, different experience. Even my second tour. Even your second Even tour. The, yeah. So the second tour went out there, and by then I was a staff sergeant, and I thought that we were going to have a different opportunity for some liberty. And actually, we had two Mark 142 operators, you know, Mux, Mux radio guys, that went out to a retrain site to do a site survey, and they found a lawn dart that they thought it was a toy lawn dart, brought it back, and they took it apart. Well, it was not a lawn dart. They ended up having it in the seat of a Humvee, and the door had, had opened on the Humvee. These, this lawn dart toy fell out of the Humvee, exploded. It was actually unexploded ordnance. Hit our two engineers. that we, we only had two engineers. I was with 3rd Mardiff Com Company. Hit the two engineers, so they got shrapnel from a UXO device. They locked down the entire AOR. So this is 2001 tandem thrust. So they locked down the entire AOR for safety briefs. Com Company, 3rd Mardiff. No liberty the entire exercise. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Two mux operators, a lawn dart at a, at a retrain site. It's a, uh, yep, still, it's, yeah. So that was my second tour in Australia. And then when you got back to the States, who, who were you, what unit were you with out, out here in California? Uh, Ninth Com Battalion. And I, I did eight years and change in one sitting at Ninth Com Battalion. So I became kind of like, the, the, the grand old man over that way there. And I went from staff to gunny, picked up warrant officer, came right back to ninth com, and then went to warrant officer two, warrant officer three. And, and by that point, our, our battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Nethercott, she had seen how long I'd been there. And she's like, you have my blessing to try to see something else in the Marine Corps. She's like, if you want to try to get orders somewhere, she's like, she's like, I will help you. She wasn't trying to kick me out of the unit. She was just like, you've been here too long, Ski. It's time for you to see different things. It's a long time to be in one. Yeah, year. so many memories that I've got there. So when I talk to people that were at Ninth Com, for me it's one eight year sitting, and I can't really break it up other than the fact that I went on four deployments to Iraq from there. But aside from that, I remember the deployments well. But it's one giant memory at being at Ninth Com. So I have a hard time saying what years did I see this guy there? What years did I see this gal there? It's, uh, it's just one big chunk. Did you retire from NITHCOM or where did you retire? So after NITHCOM, I went to Marine Corps Systems Command for three years. Then I, I tried to retire out of there, but uh, the monitor had different plans for me and, and actually declined my request to retire. I, I requested the, the retirement outside the 14 month window. So they declined it, forced me to get promoted, which was not a bad thing. And then I went to base telephone camp Lejeune, which, which is where I retired out of. So two great tours of duty for my last. Um, five years in the Marine Corps that really set me up for a uh, follow-on civilian career. It's, you know, it's funny when you first started talking about, uh, well, I started the episode saying you're, you're one of the smartest people I know. And I got to the combat in 2003, I think. And it's interesting because you were, one of the, the most known, well-liked staff and CEOs out there that had this knowledge of TechCon and, and all these, you know, all the wizardry and all that stuff. And, but then to hear you talk about how you, you know, barely made it through high school and, and, and all that stuff, it's, it's mind-blogging to me that, uh, 
that that's that's your backstory and um it's 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 like a cool testament that it doesn't matter where you started really it's it's kind of where you where you are going and you know what you've done and um and i'm not lying i remember it, we could talk about deployments but i remember being out in iraq with you and you're studying moves in chess and you know, one of the, I, you're the first person I've ever met that would like read a book on how to study chess moves and, and all the strategy and all that stuff. I didn't even know that that was a thing until I saw you doing it. And, um, so I, I think anybody that's better at chess than I am is, is wicked smart. And you're one of those guys, but, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy to hear you talk about the the old well, I, days. I know where that transition happened. And it's, it's funny because I, I can literally put my finger on where my transition from being not kind of intellectual to to actually liking intellectual things. It, it happened when I was at Nightcom and I had shown up there. Prior to that, I was always part of the pack. You know, there was never any separation. I never got sent out by myself because I was just the wrong job. And when I became a tech controller, I went to third Mar Div, and I still went out. There was only there was only three of us, so we always went out together. So I was always part of a pack. And when I got to Ninth Com, I was still in that pack mentality. I really wasn't doing anything that was moving and shaking outside of that pack. But I get to Ninth Com, we deploy to I Iraq for my first deployment, and we get out there. And Meth Main is going to be going up through Babylon. Well, I'm part of the pack. But I'm not part of that pack because I wasn't part of the good old boy network at this point here. That's where that transition happened for me where I was always part of the pack. So Meth Forward was jumping up to Babylon. I wasn't part of that group. They were it was they were heading that way. So I became part of the group that was going to stay at Commando, Camp Commando in Kuwait, and just be part of the main party. Always part of the pack. And I was comfortable in that pack. But the Brits were actually in need of a tech controller. We were going to be supporting the, the meth liaison officers that were going to be there. And that individual had to be able to operate this legacy multiplexer. It was older than dirt. Everybody that was in TechCon at Nightcom at that time was trained on the newer stuff. So my legacy experiences from Third Mar Div and, uh, and going to school before some of the guys that were there and weren't part of the forward, I became the guy that was going to go out with the Brits by myself. So I was intimidated at this point here. This is that comfort zone piece. And I was like, thinking to myself, I don't even know if I've got the capability to do this, but when you're, when you're tasked with doing it, you've got no choice. So I went out there and uh, turned out that I did have the capability to do it. And then I became the guy that was the, the one guy. And I became that tech controller for like four months out there with the Brits and, you know, day on kind of stay on sleeping on my post kind of deal. I might, I had my, my cot inside of a little trailer and my FCC 100s were next door. It was uh, bouncing around the desert doing all kinds of stuff, but, that's where I started kind of really coming into my own. And uh, that, that was my first experience being on my own and, and realizing that, that I enjoyed this and I had to think for myself, I had to troubleshoot. I was the guy that went down. I had to get it back up. And from that day forward, that's where I, I really started connecting the dots. And I, I started seeing, I guess, the, the, just my job differently. I started, I, I have a horrendous memory. It, it sucks, but... I can look at a system and I can figure out the dots. I won't remember what I did later on and how to do it. I can't replicate it, but I've always been great since that point of just connecting the dots and making it work. Crappy memory, but I make it work. Yep, yep. <laughs> so that was your first your your first combat tour, right? Is is in 2003 or was it Yeah, 2000 2003 was the first. Yep, yep. You had mentioned that your stepdad was a Vietnam veteran, right? What branch of the service was he? He was Army. He was he a was small weapons specialist in the Army, yeah. And then, um, you know, I wanted to ask this too. When you got back home, and, and we'll talk about, you know, future deployments after this, but when you got back home, did you go home and, and talk to your, your stepdad? And, and was there like a different type of connection you know, both being, um, you know, combat, both having combat experience and um, going through those type of uh, situations. So interestingly, it's it's absolutely different, different relationship with my stepdad after that. Prior to my deployments, I don't think that me and him ever connected on any level 
Um, I never really understood him at that, you know, he kicked me out of the house and I was, I didn't have resentment towards him, but I was like, I just, I just didn't really, I just really didn't have a relationship with him. He never talked about his days in Vietnam. He never talked about any of his military experience. I only knew that he had served because of my mom and uh, he, he just never, never talked about it. He had you know, some things that really disturbed him from his days there. After I came back, he never really opened up about it, but he did talk to me about military life in general and my relationship with him has been great you know over these years now and uh it's funny because parts of my family resent him for how it went down but i look at it as now i see what he was trying to do i see that i see the purpose that he had he made his, his method might have been not the way that i would have gone but i respect the man immensely he's still alive today he's he's, he's in his 80s and uh, his health is failing but he's still alive and i have a great relationship with him he's he's uh Definitely part of my life at this point. Uh, Jason, did you have any other siblings? I do. I have a younger brother and I have a younger sister. What did they think about you joining the military? So when I left Connecticut after I got kicked out of the house, I, I honestly don't recall even running it by them. Because once I left Connecticut, I, I had a chip on my shoulder and I, I moved to Florida. I was out of sight, out of mind. I was doing my own thing. And uh, I did talk to my dad, who was Army, and my grandfather, my grandparents, and my mom. I remember telling them about it. My dad and my grandparents were, were kind of like, Air Force or Navy, man, that's the way to go. Better training over there. But my mom was supportive of anything that I was going to do that was going to get me into a better path. And my, my family overall did support the Marine Corps, but they thought that I was going to get a better training experience out of the, uh, the Air Force and the Navy. We know that's not true. Calm is calm. Technology is technology. We have the same training, and uh, but but you think of Marines as knuckle draggers, and uh, I think they had that mentality as well. But uh, yeah, they supported it. Any other your any other family members in uh, in the military as well? No, my brother considered doing the Coast Guard, but that whole giving up his freedom of choice as to where they station you that wasn't for him. He tried to petition kind of a, a deal that he stayed somewhere in in the New Haven area. But uh, that's not the way that it works. So he, he found a different calling. He's been very successful in his, in his path. Yeah. But everyone else in my family was Army. My dad, my uncle, who's passed, uh, my grandfather, um, a lot of my uncles and uh, you know, extended family were, were all Army. I'm the only one that kind of deviated and went uh, the Marine Corps route. Had to break the mold, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that video, I still, if it wasn't for that video, I have no doubt that I would not have joined the Marine Corps. I probably would have done the Air Force or the Navy. It, uh, it all started there. And I was my recruiter's last contract before he retired. So he didn't pull any wool over my eyes. He told me just the way that it was. And, uh, you know, it, 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 no regrets, you know. Wasn't slaying the dragon video, was it? No, it was, it, I hate to say it, it was actually about, it, it, I remember there was the, it, it showed every job kind of that you could do and it talked about everything you could do, but it also had that esprit de corps camaraderie pride thing inside there, but it talked about the jobs that you could do. And, and it, it's, it, it actually did break that, that paradigm that I had in my brain at that time that it was a knuckle dragger thing. I was like, Holy cow, you can actually do electronics and cool stuff like that. And you know, the, the blood stripe and all, all that camaraderie stuff was there too. It, it, uh, I remember it, it hooked me. I was, I was sold after I watched that video. It's so funny to talk to Marines about what what sold them, who sold them, and how it all went down. And it's the uniform, it's the the propaganda videos, you yeah. know, it's all those things. A lot of times, uh, I I have a buddy who uh, who joined the Marine Corps on kind of on accident. He's like, I'm done. I'm just done with civilian life. I'm gonna go join the military. And he went over, pulled the Air Force door, tried to get it open. It was locked. Went over the army, it was locked. Marine Corps, it was open. So, he went <laughs> and joined, so. well, it's funny. I, I was going to be a one tour kind of guy when I was in Okinawa. I had fully intended to get out. I loved Okinawa. I wanted to stay there as a civilian. So I started basically setting myself up. I went to a, a, a new car salesman interview. I was going to try to work for AP's new car sales there in Okinawa. And somewhere in, in my process of being, you know, prepping to get out. I ended up buying like this four thousand dollar car, which I look back and you know now I'm like that that that's not something that would solidify me staying in the Marine Corps. But that four thousand dollar car that I bought as a corporal, 
I thought I could bring it back to the States, but turns out that you, you can, there's some stipulations there, but I couldn't. So I have this $4,000 car, I'm coming up in my EAS, I can't get rid of it, I can't sell it, and so instead of writing it off, I, I re-enlisted. And so I, I did the re-enlistment piece, and uh, I remember even the re my re-enlisting officer was like, congratulations, I was like, no, you don't understand, this wasn't supposed to be the way it goes down. And I re-enlisted for three years, I was that determined that I was not staying in. And uh, I passed the bonus, you know, I didn't get a bonus for doing a three-year re-enlistment, and then they sent me back to the States anyways, a year later. So I, I lap moved, went back to Okinawa. And, uh, but then I ended up getting married and uh, my life took a different path, came back to the States. And I still intended to get out when I was at NICOM. I was working with Staff Sergeant Ard at the time. Um, I think you remember him, Pat. And I, I went to Tap and Tamps and uh, for you know separations briefs. And it was the last day of the bonus, the next day. So we're in Tap and Tamp and I had no job offer. And I told Ard while we're in that uh, tap and temp thing, if I'm not here tomorrow, it's because I didn't get a job offer solidified with this company I'm talking to. And I'm going to the shop tomorrow to re-enlist because I already had my re-enlistment approved. I was keeping all my options open and I did not want to re-enlist, but I went down and uh, I made the call to the company I was talking to for the, the job. They didn't get the contract yet, so they couldn't give me a firm job offer and it wasn't happening in the next 24 hours. So I went back, re-enlisted, got my multiple of one small bonus, my first one ever though while I was in, and uh, got that, and still never even intended to stay in. But once I got warrant officer and I had an indefinite contract, it never, it, the, the decision point never never came across my radar again because I was indefinite until I decided that I was ready to, to hang it up. What made you become a warrant officer? What made you decide to do that switch? So. It's funny because in the comm world, there's a lot of warrant officers. So every platoon that I worked in, from the moment I hit the fleet to even, you know, when, once I got warrant officer, every platoon I worked in was headed by a warrant officer. And something about the prestige of those red bars, you know, I, I just, I, I loved that balance that they're an officer, but they've also got their feet, you know, tied into the enlisted world as well. And that that whole mentality that, they didn't go to college. I, you know, I went to college and a lot of them do go to college, but we liked, you know, that, that whole mentality that they had that, you know, these, the, the red on my, on my bars is the education I got from the blood and sweat and tears that I did learning how to do my job. And that, that prestige working for warrant officers just, just had me hooked. Even from the, from the moment I was, I think corporal was when I realized that I really wanted to go that direction. And once I got eligible for warrant officer, I put in the first year, didn't get it and uh, put in the second year. And by some miracle, um, I got it. And it, it was a dream that I had from uh, earlier on in my career. And you were a gunny at that time, right? When you switched over? Yeah, it was funny how that all happened. Though. When I was a staff sergeant, I was like three years out of the zone for gunny. And they, they revamped the entire tech control MOS where they were going to make it entry level. And in the process of making entry level, they, they, they increased the structure by like a hundred and something Marines. Before they made it entry level, they fattened the pyramid from Sergeant to Master Guns. So in one year, they promoted three years of gunnies and really screwed up the MOS. Then the next year, they made it entry level and, and, and shrink that, that pyramid and really, you know, really screwed a lot of Marines. But in that process, for that one officer year, that one officer board that year, they pulled five of us that had picked up gunny that year I think they were kind of doing it to try to help up the MOS because they really screwed it up as far as rank structure. And uh, so I, just, I, I picked up Gunny and Warrant Officer in the same year. And unfortunately, I pinned on Gunny, so I actually got to wear the the, the, the rockers for uh, for a short period of time. But uh, but I'm convinced that that whole restructuring really gave me that onus. I'd like to say my abilities got me there, but uh, but I think it was a brink or man, man power number because five of us were Gunnies. So after you pinned on Warrant Officer, and, and that was at 9th Comet Battalion, you went to the basic school, right? And was that three months for for? Uh, for us, we go out there for uh, three months for basic school, for TBS, and then the uh, comm school there was another eight weeks or 10 weeks or something. So total almost roughly six months, just shy of permanent duty station orders. And with a Comet Battalion, you... You got back from, was it OIF-1 when you were down in Kuwait and then went up and then you went to OIF-2, is that right? Yeah, that's where I got selected and pinned down Gunny in OIF-2 at Fallujah, 
got selected for warrant officer because I remember when Colonel Reynolds was our CO, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds was our CO at the time. And when the warrant officer board had come out that morning, we were doing our, our stand-up brief for Colonel Reynolds. And she said inside the, the brief, she goes, well, what are you going to do when you pin on warrant officer? Are you going to fix this problem here? You know, because, and the board had just released, so it was brand new information. So that's how she broke the news to me that I was selected for warrant officer. So that was, uh, that was pretty awesome. I, yeah, I loved working for her. That's cool. Yeah, she's probably one of the most brilliant officers I've ever served under, you know, just amazing talent. Yep, she graded you at your merits. And uh, if you were if you were good at what you did, she she praised you. If you weren't good at what you did, she she provided guidance and uh, she, you know, she she held you at your merits. I remember, I remember many, many mornings doing the brief. <laughs> it was like, it was like a murder board. <laughs> you know, just, just, <laughs> just yeah, the Syscon the watch officers had some, uh, some fun and adventures. We try to synchronize TechCon with Syscon to make sure that the stories all matched. But sometimes it was FM, and I don't want to say what the F stands for, but it was F and magic. You, know, you didn't have an RFO. You know, resolution before um, isolation, I think, was one of, the, one of the terms we used. Basically, I have no idea what happened. You know, it just had to have some fancy way to describe it, though. And it was it was hard with her because she was so intelligent and just knew everything, right? So yeah, yeah. Most officers, you could probably pull the wool over them, you know, just a little bit, but uh, but not her. No. Let's talk about that deployment a little bit. Um, I know that you were and you were in the Ford element. I think we both were right when Techcom was just a trailer in the in the dust and yeah, yeah. But walk me through that deployment and that experience and, and what that was like for you. Yeah, so it's you know, interesting on that deployment there, there was two of us that were gunnies. I know that I picked up, but they were me and, uh, me and Heath Miller. We went out there together and we were kind of running the, the two different shifts of TechCon. And that was one of my opportunities, again, to kind of, to, to kind of be the guy. So I was you know, doing the morning briefs with Colonel Reynolds every morning. And uh, I had my, my day shift with the junior tech controllers. And that was... That was a really good learning experience. But I, I remember in, we had some unique times out there because front lines don't exist anymore. I mean, they do. I mean, we're, it's, there's two different Marine Corps out there. You know, we've got the, the door kickers that are out there on the streets that are, that are, that are, that are really making stuff happen. They're, they're fighting the war. And then we've got our support guys. And I, I don't like the term Pogue, but we have the support guys that are there. We're, we have a different life. We're on a hard stand base. But that hard stand base still doesn't provide a level of, of safety that, that that's here in the U.S. I mean, we had rockets and mortars coming down, you know, three, four, five times a day. I remember being inside those meetings in the morning and even the alarm would go off, but the incoming already came in by the time the alarm came off. So um, I, I, I remember a lot of us just kind of, you, you wrestle with, is your number going to come up that day? So you're, you're faced with that reality that you're, you're, you're not in Camp Pendleton on the backside. Your, your number can come up. And, you know, we had a few guys that did get shrapnel there. And uh, fortunately, we we didn't really have that many losses. I mean, we lost dust and sides. And uh, so we, we did lose some some guys and gals out that way there. And we saw other units losing losing Marines as well. But that that I think that realization that this isn't just a job. You know, we signed our name on a dotted line. And we, we went forward deployed. And we all went out there and we did our jobs successfully. And, and we balanced the realization that it could all kind of, uh, it, it could all kind of end if your number came up, you know? And I think that that's, um, that's important to, to know and to realize that, you know, you're, you're right that there's this, these two sides of the Marine Corps, the, the door kickers and then the support. Um, and Blake, I, I mean, you're considered on the support side, right? Yeah, I was on, I was motor T. With two purple hearts, right? So I, I, I mean, just to, just to prove the point is that like you had motor T guys that were hooking and jab and you had guys in comm. I mean, we had our convoy that got hit, uh, when we lost Dustin and, um, you, you know, so you're right. You never really knew what the day was going to bring, how that was going to, you know, happen, um, I remember uh, marking a lot all the days that we'd get incoming. I'd put little tick marks and, you know, try and see how many we can get in a day. But you're right. I mean, it's just, it's a war zone, right? And everybody's experience is a little bit different. Um, some 
some have really horrible experiences, some have, you know, fun, good experiences and, but all kind of meshes up in the middle. Um, but it affects everybody in such a different way, right? Like I, I know amputees that, um, you would think that they would be completely messed up because they're missing a limb, but they're totally fine. Right. And then other people who were, you know, quote unquote pogues that just can't figure out how to live their next day. Right. So, um, you know, to your point, it's just, it, it's two different sides, but it's all the same. Yeah. I think we had, I think if, if memory serves me right, there was roughly 39, somewhere in that number impacts in the ninth com area. Every one of our com pieces had shrapnel holes in it. Techon trailer, Syscon trailer, everything had shrapnel holes in it. We had our bunkers that were, that were littered. I remember one of those 122 millimeter rockets that hit, hit smack dab in the walkway right next to Syscon, Techon, and right by the setcom antenna. And holy cow, that was our main walkway between those areas to the building. And there happened to be nobody there when that rocket hit, you know, that, that it's, it, it's just, it's crazy to me to even think back that we had, th- you know, 39 impacts in our battalion area. And we had just, you know, I remember one of the sergeants, I can't remember his last name, got shrapnel in his hand. You know, we were so lucky. There were so many, there was a supply trailer that the supply guys used to hang out at back in our, in that deployment. And they, they usually were in that trailer. Their, their building was the hard stand, but that was like a smoke trailer. And they weren't in the trailer, and a rocket literally had, had hit right next to the thing and littered it. I got pictures on my hard drive of the thing, and it was like, my gosh, man, if it hit five minutes earlier, we would have lost like four or five supply guys and gals. But uh, so so many opportunities that we could have had worse experiences there than we did, so we were blessed. Well, were you there in August when um, – so after Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds, Lieutenant Colonel Shea was supposed to come in. And in August, so I had, I think I just left in the beginning of, or mid August and he was doing, I think they were doing a rip with one of the regiment, the RCTs that was coming out and replace, I think they're RCT five. And, um, you know, he's in a hard stand building doing a turnover when a rocket came in through the window. Yeah. I think that was 2006 for that one there. That was, you're right. That was 2006. So, um, but still, you know, pretty much the same location that it really didn't matter. So right next door to us in the, in the RCT building, right. He was briefing the Colonel and it came right through the window, which was sandbagged and, and it got him and the Sergeant Major got shrapnel as well. But of course, unfortunately, you know, Major Shea at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Shea, um, you know, obviously took the brunt of that one and, uh, and the rest is solved. 2004, second deployment. What was that like when you got home and, you know, how, how old was your son at the time? He was just knee high to a grasshopper, man. He, he was born in 2001. So we're, we're talking three years old. He didn't remember me coming back on uh, the early deployments. Yeah. So I got home and I, I do remember one memory where he, you know, well, first when I, when I saw him in the back of the truck that uh, my ex-wife you know, came to pick me up and I opened the truck door and he looks over. And he's like, who the heck are you? And I reach in and he's like, whoa, no, no, I, you don't want none of that. And, uh, you know, so that was, that was kind of, uh, a, that, that tugs your heart a little bit. And, but I remember when I went home, because we had so much incoming coming in during that, that second deployment that uh, my son being young, I do remember he, he was playing in the living room or something. I was taking a nap on the couch and he yelled and I, I jumped up. And uh, I was angry because I was like, you know, it's, you're stop making so much noise. It, it just because it, my heart was racing at that point. There. I was in you know, run to the bunker mode, you know, and I'm glad that I don't have that 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 kind of uh, that baggage at all. Because I know some guys and girls, when they hear fireworks go off now, you, you remember the, the booms in the distance and the artillery in the distance. But uh, I'm so glad that I, I don't have any of those those pieces. But there was the potential. I, I clearly saw that there was the potential to have that kind of baggage. So to speak, and I don't know the right word for it. So I'm going to call it baggage, but it's absolutely not the right word. So it's a negative connotation to it. But uh, remnants of, of of service overseas is probably a better way to describe it. Artifacts that we don't want to carry with us. Yeah, and then Jason, okay, so I got a question for you. Yeah. Um. So you talked about you twenty twenty one years of service. 
in that 21 years, is there a leader that sticks out anywhere in your service that helped mold you where you are? You know, and it's funny, there, there, there's actually two in, in you know, General Reynolds at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds and uh, Lieutenant Colonel now General Nethercott. Um, both of those, I would say, absolutely are two leaders that I work for that that I I highly respect. I've tried to model the way that I lead because they both led very similar ways. They, different personalities, absolutely, between the two of them. But they held you and they graded you on your merits. I, I hated working for for leaders that were in the good old boy network. And I kind of threw that out there about the meth forward going up. There is always a good old boy network out there sometimes. And I was never that guy that was in the good old boy network. You know, I, I think I get along great with people, but I've never been one of the good old boys. And when leaders had a good old boy network, everybody knew. So the, the leaders that I've emulated are the ones that if you're good at your job, you know what, I'm gonna grade you as good at your job. If you're if you're an average Marine, yeah, I'm going to coach you. You know, we're going to we're all going to get along. And if you're bad at your job, I'm still going to get along with you. I'm still not I'm not going to withhold any opportunities. I'm going to give you opportunities to advance. And I'm also going to do my part as a leader to give you constructive criticism to, to help you along the way. So I, I don't I don't ever do good old boy network stuff. I'm not a fan of it at all. I grade you at your merits and I tr try to provide guidance no matter what as to how to become better in your job. And, and and training. I love training. Heck, that's I've got my own e-learning site that I do. I like teaching. I like tutoring. I like coaching. Um, I still even do it in my job today. I, I love being a source of information and uh, and, and and just I, I'm not going to chase people down. That's even as a marine. I remember I made a guide, and we had this box called the BX 900. It had come out as part of our this. It was it was it was. It was all across the Marine Corps, but it, it was part of our TSM, Transition Switch Module. And I don't want to get down to acronym soup, but there was a box in it called the BX900 that was extremely complicated to configure. And there was only a handful of guys and gals in 9th Com that could configure it. And I did not like the fact that there was only that small handful. So I decided I was going to make a guide on how to configure it in a Marine Corps communications environment. And I ended up getting three BX900s at my desk up at the MEP when I was stationed up there. I think it's 2006 time frame. Might have been 2008, one of the two deployments. And I made a 50 some odd page guide that went into the technical details of how to do it and everything else. And when I finished the guide, I was like, you know what? I spent hundreds of hours QCing it and making this a professional guide. And I was like, I don't want to send it out now because I feel like it's going to make this, the, the turd actually able, you know, and then I, I, I had to put myself back in check and I was like, I made this for the, the average Marine that does not have the opportunity to learn it. So I sent it off to every comm chief and, and staff and here that I knew in the wire community. And it grew legs. General Dynamics actually approached me to get my, my signature to, to allow them to put it as an appendix to the DTC. So they put it in, as in, in the technical manual as an, an appendix because they didn't want to have to go back and rewrite any of that thing. And the knowledge that was in it was, was what they wanted to do. So even at that point, then I started getting calls to teach the VX900 to some of the wire platoons. And each time there would always be one or two Marines that would kind of, even as a Lance Corporal, you know, Lance Corporals, in, Lance Corporals they're, sometimes they're, they're intimidated by, by, by a warrant officer. But I always tried to be, here's the whiteboard, you know, let's put rank aside. This is, this is a mentoring teaching opportunity. And there would always be one or two Marines that would take me up on it. And they would hit me up emails and they would send questions to me. And I always took the time to share what, what I had. But I always had in my, you know, it's kind of a rule as well as if you don't come after me or ask me questions, I am not going to chase your butt down and force information down your throat. I, I will be a resource to you, but I'm not going to fire. I always affect it to you, you know, but I'm here. And uh, that's just kind of even, even today, I have the same mentality with, uh, with junior people that do what I do. You know, I'll, I'll share information with you. But if you don't, if you don't want to know, I'm not going to force it to you. It's just not might work my time. See what I mean? One of the smartest guys. <laughs> yeah. Jason, 2006 deployment. Um, how how was that different from the first two? And then um, walk us through a little bit through that time frame and and kind of the next steps through your your service. Yeah, so as we as we progressed through the four deployments, you know, the first one I, I did the Brits 
out there manning those old, old legacy FCC 100s. Second one, we're at Camp Fallujah on the, on the main, working you know a lot of incoming rounds. And those were both seven month deployments. And then we come out there for 2006 and we're doing 13 months. And you, you really get into kind of a 12 on, 12 off, 12 on, 12 off every single day. It's the, it's the routine. But at that point I was a warrant officer. So there was no 12 on, 12 off. I had my wire platoon that was working 24 seven. So I, I, I basically just worked lights to lights out that way there and, and worked with my Marines. But uh, for the second half of 2006, I got pulled up to the MEF and ended up working inside that planning role. And once again, forced me out of my comfort zone because now I went from being a wire platoon commander where I'm looking at 26 pair of copper going across and, and really having an easy, to, you, know, you gotta get a phone over there. Well, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. You're gonna run a cable over there. But once I got to that MEF level, now you're talking about dial plans and how calls are being routed across the AOR, how calls are getting routed outside the feeder if there's issues. So, and now you're, you're the guy that's got to answer to the full bird colonel who's answering to the chief of staff or somebody over inside the general shed as to why telephones aren't working the way that they should. So that, that, that level of responsibility expanded, which then forced me, of course, to learn a lot more about my job in traffic engineering and, and just how things were being kind of routed across the entire AOR. So that was, that was a really cool experience in 2008. When I went back out, I, I worked at the MEF the entire year. So I was the, the MEF telephone officer at that point there and, uh, you know, got to, to continue that, that, that growing adventure and uh, becoming more seasoned and mature inside of my, uh, just, just my, my existence, you know what I mean? And uh, just developing into the person that I am kind of today. Com is so important in the, in the military, right? Um, especially moving for, you know, going out, deploying forward. Uh, when we first went out there into Fallujah, there was nothing out there back in 2004. It was just like just dirt lots. Right. And then we had, you know, fast forward, then, then you're bringing in telephone services, you're bringing in the internet or nippernet. And then by the time 2006 rolled around, I got two weeks notice to deploy for that year in 2006 and I was with a meth and celebrating, you know, birthdays, anniversary, everything before I left, you got to go pack up and go and was out, out there. And, uh, you know, I called home to my wife just to check in to see how she's doing. And she's like, I'm doing great. But, uh, guess what you left me with? Like, what's that? She's like, I'm pregnant. I'm like, good, good luck and have fun with that, you know? But, um, so, you know, fast forward through later on that deployment, I was in my hooch and somebody, so my wife was in labor back here in California and somebody drove out to my hooch, picked me up and was like, Hey, your wife's on the phone in labor and <laughs> wants to talk to you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Just the idea of that. So we didn't have Facebook and we didn't have all those other things, but just the idea that my wife, who's in labor in a hospital in Murrieta, California, can call Fallujah, Iraq, and get me on the phone to be there while she's in labor. Do you know what I mean? And that concept, you know, I think that we just kind of gloss over that type of stuff because we're just used to it, right? We're in a, a society that has internet and phones at the at our fingertips whenever we want but back in those days that was super advanced and then go back to you know your stepdad's time and, and my dad's time and Blake your dad's time too when and in World War II as well that if you wanted to get in touch with a loved one you were sending you know snail mail out there and hopefully it made it out there right and then it's just like the speed of information is just so fast now it's crazy and to think about you know how how you walk you know the meth through that of getting out there establishing radio comms phones you know all that stuff it's just it's mind-boggling to me and i think it's something that we take for granted all the time right yeah being a telephone officer I had some unique opportunities there to have telephone service no matter where i went and you know it's it's funny there's one story that comes to my mind that uh, when I was in the G6, 
as I mentioned, you know, I was playing with those boxes and I made that guide. Well, I was also very, very savvy with configuring these smaller switchboards. And I remember we were working, Major Salcedo was uh, the operations officer up there at the time. I, th I think that was his actual role. But, uh, but he, so he was kind of doing a hops kind of, kind of thing. And we had to put a switch out in line over in Hurricane Point, out in, out in town, in, in the city of Ramadi, so off of Hurricane Point. And I ended up being the guy to go install this 24-line switch in, the, 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 in this, this building in Ramadi. And Major Sal, I remember he may have had a conversation with me. He's like, he's like, you're a warrant officer. You should not be going to do this kind of stuff here. There's plenty of other Marines that can do this kind of stuff. But ultimately, it came down to that one box, the DX900. There wasn't a lot of guys and gals that could do it. So I ended up becoming the guy to go do it. And I rolled out there with another warrant officer that was kind of just going out there with me to, to assist. But we put this 24-line this switch online, got that DX900 configured to go over a microwave system back to Hurricane Point. But it's, it's these two buildings in the middle of Ramadi. And I remember, I thought we were winning the war at this time. You know, it was Fallujah, the camp, and the incoming had stopped. So I just figured that, you know, stuff is going good. But when we did this convoy out in the middle of Ramadi, the locals did not like us. And every building was littered with holes. And uh, a lot of buildings were collapsed. And the infantry guys that were driving, this was an infantry convoy, you know, four vehicles or five vehicles deep. And any vehicle that moved, they're shooting flares to that vehicle, the, 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 the turret gunners are, are training on them. And I'm like, this war is not over. And we get to the, the buildings and you, the only, you had to run from the Humvees into the buildings. was that all they had was two buildings in the middle of the city. And so that was a really unique experience. But when I installed that 24 line switch, being a telephone guy and knowing the pin codes for everything and knowing how to set stuff up, I took one phone and I put it there on the switch and I put the DSN number to the, the gateways back in the States. And I, and I told the, the Marines that were there, I said, this is how you can call home to mama or whomever you want to call back to. Here's the code. You just have to have a phone card after this. Well, if you live on base, you, you dial the DSN number. But I, but I, I was like, you're going to have a phone here. And I called it a morale phone. And the rest of the phones we replaced for the leadership. But I, I made it a point to, here's at least one phone. You know, They probably hadn't called home in, in months, but I gave them a phone with DSN service and it didn't cost me anything. I could have just set up the, the switch, but uh, but I felt I, I, I wanted to give them something to, to be able to reach back home to. Yeah, it was a cool experience. And then while we're on top of the roof one day, I remember machine guns opened up and the infantry guy opened up and there's there were sandbags all over. I got a pistol on my hip. There ain't nothing coming out. I mean, it, so I just sat down on the ground and I was like, this is not what a telephone guy is supposed to be doing, but it opened my eyes to a different side of the of the war. I thought we were winning. And uh, like I said, uh, those guys had two buildings in the center of Ramadi and that was their life. It was, it was, it was eye opening. Uh, I, I used one of those in, uh, in Karma. Yeah. Uh, right out, right at East Fallujah. So I used one of those landlines. I think this was 2008 on that All one the there. Uh, seven, yeah, it was almost at the end of 2007. Yep. Yeah, it was really cool. So all those deployments run into one for me. Like 2006 and 2008, I was at the MEF. So it depends on what year Major Cell was there because that was the year that uh, that I went out that side. I, I, it it might have been 2006, but I think it might have been. Yeah, it must have been 2006 because 2008 was started. The other story, there's, there's a funny story with, with that involves you and uh, Master Sergeant Manor. I was talking to Master Sergeant Manor, retired now, um, last week about this very story. So, and you'll get a kick out of this one, Blake. Inside of our office, we had a, a desk called the MCCC, and we had this Master Sergeant. We all got along great, but after you're, you're stationed out somewhere for a year, you start playing jokes on people and doing pranks and stuff like that. Well, Pat here had his phone in the office, you know, 20 feet away, and, and Master Manor was his chief, but when Master Manor was working on the MCCC, he sat at a different desk. So Pat would pick up the phone, and Craig call him with all kinds of different messages and stuff like that. Well, me being the telephone officer, I knew the codes on the phone to do, you, you push a PIN number, and it tells you the, the phone that actually calls you. So one day I went over to, to, to Top Manor, and I said, hey, next time it happens, do this PIN code. And... I was chuckling inside because I knew it was Pat, you know, and uh, so Manor does it. And he comes, I said, uh, did you do it? And he goes, he said, yeah, it was my phone number. And I'm like, he's like, it's not working. And I'm thinking to myself, you know the answer now. It's, it is your phone. There's someone sitting there, but it took him 
I remember talking to him about it and it took him a minute. To, he's like, oh my God. And that's when, you know, it was, it was just too darn funny. But, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of great memories in that regard there, camaraderie. Because you're in a shared space. Well, what else are you going to do in Iraq? You're, you're working lights to lights and you are going to have fun with people. And I, I took that opportunity with my knowledge of the pin codes on the switches and what it can do for you to, uh, to have my own. Yeah, I've, I've got some pictures of uh, the camel's ass. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Blake, the camel's ass was was basically a smoke pit, and uh, out out in the back we'd smoke cigars and pipes and all that type of stuff. And I don't know who or where that sign came from, but it was a picture of a camel looking to the back, but it was the it was the backside yeah. of the camel's ass. <laughs> And I think, oh, you know what? Was it the the Aloha Monkey? Is that where it came from? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That so it's it you know real, a lot of good memories from from that deployment too, and just and it's fun to be able to to have some some fun times, right? And I mean, it's not all fun and games, but just to be able to laugh and play some jokes and things like that too. So yeah, the camaraderie and the shared experience, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know about the other branches, but it's so funny to hear Marines say about like pictures because, I mean, some of us, we had Burt Reynolds in our Humvees just sitting in the back, just <laughs> there and shirtless. And just it, it was a hilarious thing to look back and be like, why is Burt Reynolds in my truck? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Oh, Blake just passed out. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the sense of humor of, of Marines is, is so different. You know, I, I've I've worked with other veterans from other services and, you know, we tell stories and, and then they look at you like, you did what? You said what? You had what? Yeah, and I, it's I've, <laughs> different. I've got one that's probably not appropriate. So if it's not appropriate, then edit it out. But like, so my, my son, who's in college now, he's 21. He was telling me a story of a, of a kid that he's, that he was with and the kid whispered in his ear on one of the trains in Japan and there, you know, studies, the, the kid whispered in his ears that he's like, I can rape you right now. Well, I started laughing hysterically because Marines do that all the time. They would, they would make all kinds of innuendos and jokes like that. So he's like, well, it's not funny, dad. And I'm like, you don't understand. I said, you know, that's, 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 that's how Marines would talk to each other as a joke. You know, we would just take it as a joke and we'd actually probably respond back and say, you don't have the, you know, something, you know, you had some, some response back to carry it even, even further. And, uh, but he was, he was kind of sickened by the, by the thing. He's like inappropriate. And, uh, I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> and I knew, I understand his perspective, but it, the Marine humor in me came out and I was like, I can understand that humor, you know, but, uh, he didn't understand it. It's just different walk of life. And, and some of us are in our, our mid to late forties right now. And, and, you know, it takes us back to being a teenager. And yeah, just laughing yeah. At stupid jokes. Yeah, and I try to not laugh. And then his mom, my ex-wife, is also a former Marine. And uh, and I, I asked him if he had asked her about it, and I said, "How'd she respond?" And he, and he said that she laughed too. So <laughs> I was like, "Okay, so I'm not off base on this one here." So is he living in Okinawa right now? No, so he's he's living in Pittsburgh, but he's a junior in University of Pitt. But he did a study abroad. He loves Japanese studies, loves anime, loves the language. He's studying linguistics. So he's in right outside of Osaka going to Konan University for one whole semester through the end of May. So he's he's living his best life over there. He absolutely loves Japan. So what made you love Japan so much? What was what was it that, that pulled you? pulled you in and, and made you want to go back it was the cars absolutely the, the cars. cars yeah the car scene over there i remember going down to naha and they'd be doing the quarter mile racing they'd be drifting on the streets we'd be standing there they had the coffee machines on the side of the road that had hot coffee so you're just buying coffee sitting there watching the japanese guys and gals racing and drifting i had my car but it was no, nothing like the caliber that they had down there so we would just go hang out and it's cliche to say about the uh, Fast and Furious was nothing like Fast and Furious. It was very social. There wasn't all kinds of like, you know, it 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 was just a social scene and people are racing. Cops would come, the cars would leave, the, the audience would stay, cars would come back, 
and uh, you just hang out there for hours. Yeah, definitely the cars. The cars. And the food. You know, I love the sushi and stuff like that, but cars were really the big calling I had. And then when I got married and had a kid, cars are expensive hobbies. So uh, that, that, all, that all went by the wayside. But I brought a lot of electronics back from Okinawa. I brought two engines and pieces, brought a transmission back. I was going to make a Japanese spec uh, car here in the U.S. that was with the engine and stuff. And uh, marriage definitely takes your, uh, you know, single guy's desire to spend a lot of money on a car. Marriage and a kid uh, changes those dreams and goals. And uh, you get back focused to reality. Some people don't. We know, we know guys and gals that, that pursue car dreams, but it is an expensive hobby. So, so moving ahead, you know, into your career, what were kind of the next steps? You, um, you came back to the States after the 2006, went back out in 2008. What was, you know, that's a, that's a pretty quick rotation of 2004, 2008, 2000 or 2006, 2008, um, you know, and then jumping back into home life, you know, how, how was how was each of those times that you had to jump back in and to be a dad and to be a husband and, you know, be a garrison Marine. How was that for you? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. So seven months in 03, seven months in 04, 05 was six months for TBS and comm school for warrant officer, then 06 for the entire year. And then 08 for the entire year, 2007 was absolutely the most difficult year back in home life because prior to that, I would, I'd always kind of managed the finances and stuff like that and, and had that part of, of the family life with my ex-wife. And uh, each time I came back, there'd be that, that struggle of, of whose roles and responsibilities. 2007, I was home for the entire year and my marriage was very rocky through that one year period. I think that, you know, we definitely, that, that, that broke our, our marriage. 2008, I didn't call home to talk to my, my ex-wife at all. We, we, were, we were basically done. I'm called home, talk to my son all the time. She was very supportive of that. Me, me and my ex-wife are friends today. But uh, the deployments, with all that time gone, um, it, it's it's a strain on any relationship. So you know, we came back from 2008, and the 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 I think the marriage at that point there, we we were different people, and we stayed married through 2014. But uh, I'd be lying if I and my ex-wife would probably agree with this that we were not happy. We stayed together more for, for the sake of my son, which is probably the wrong reason, but it is the wrong reason. But, uh, you know, we endured to 2014 and, uh, and then separated. But after 2008, I finished my time at Ninth Com. 2010, I went to Quantico and I was a garrison Marine, you know, Mark or Syscom doing three years acquisition environment. And uh, we stayed married through that whole period. I, I did my tour in Marine Corps Systems Command, got selected for Chief One Officer Four, and uh, tried to decline it. I wanted to retire out of Quantico, you know, basically just finish my 20 and call it a day, transition to civilian life there in Quantico. It was a perfect opportunity. But I remember I put that AA form in for the four to 14 month waiver to, to basically get a retirement date in the system so I could decline the promotion. And the waiver was declined because a lot of warrant officers did the same thing. So they just made a blanket thing of, nope, they're all declined. And uh, then went to Camp Lejeune in 2013, the base telephone and uh, basically made it 2015. I was going to stick around, but the divorce was going on and really um, child custody was going on. And I popped up on this panel to be a prisoner release panel jury member, so to speak. And there was one spot for, uh, for Marine Corps Installations East. And that spot happened to be a Chief Warrant Officer for Billet. So they needed one chief warrant officer for from Marine Corps Installations East, and you had to have a TS at some or top secret clearance at some point in your career. So I was one of three people that met the requirements that they were looking for. For I was the right rank, I was still there, and uh, and I had a TS in my past. So I I did what I thought was the best thing. I emailed over to the G1 direct, and I basically outlined my entire deployment history of everywhere I'd, I'd be, not you know summarized it. And I basically said, this is my second deployable or not deployable station in my entire career. I spent 40% of my time away from home. I'm going through a divorce right now, child custody battle. And, uh, and I said, I, I, I'd like to request to be not looked at for this, this panel. True Marine Corps fashion, my name came back as the nominee. And uh, I remember my lieutenant colonel called me and he's like, Ski, 
He's like, I, I know that you're you're kind of on the fence on how to handle this, but I need to know by tomorrow morning what you intend to do. Because if you get put on this panel, it's it's a CM coming at the Marine Corps level board, and you can't retire for two years without CMC waiver. So uh, if you if you don't have a good reason to not be on the panel, you're basically stuck. So I went home that night, and I remember I called a few of my friends that had retired, and I was like, man, I got my master's degree. Um, I've got my project management professional certificate that's almost, you know, I'm almost ready to test. Um, I've got my acquisition certifications. I was like, man, I am like set up for a civilian career. This is going to be a breeze. So I came in the next day and I, I did my request to retire, emailed to the G1 direct and I said, take me off the list. My appendix J submitted. I'm done. And, uh, and I didn't do it like that, but I, I did it professionally. But in my mind, I was like, if I'm not willing to do what the Marine Corps wants me to do, it is my time to pack my bags and and move on. I did it on my terms and uh, I'm, I'm happy with the decision, but that transition, I thought it was going to be an easy transition. Man, that that is humbling. Taking 21 years of, of Marine Corps service and thinking that you've got marketable skills. I went my entire period before my retirement date, applications, interviews, not that many interviews, let's get back, just applications for jobs, no interviews. And then I got one interview for Marine Corps Systems Command. I, I, I was applying to everything on USA Jobs and private sector. Got an interview at Marine Corps Systems Command, cold resume. And I was like, there's not even a chance in hell that they're actually going to consider me for the job. But uh, sure enough, he was looking for somebody specialized in, in something beyond acquisitions. And it happened to be Microsoft Project and scheduling and some fundamental project management stuff. And everything he asked me, I knew like the back of my hand because I've been studying for the PMP and uh, I just had some unique experiences at Syscom and lo and behold, I got the job, but it was humbling because that was the only interview that I really had. I had a couple of interviews, but it was like the only one that, that really turned into something. So I had one job offer when I got ready to retire and uh, I had no choice but to take it. And then I loved it after it ended up becoming my follow-on career, but uh, it was humbling. I, I thought that the transition from military life to civilian life was going to be really easy with, with all my certs and degrees and, and crap like that. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't happen that way. I feel like, you know, especially with, with Comarines that have TS clearances and above and have, you know, all the certifications, all those things, all the wickets that you had we're, we're sold that, hey, this transition is going to be easy. Someone's going to pick you up right away. You're going to make six figures starting out. And and for for some people, that was definitely the case, right? But you most of those people knew somebody within a company that got them in. Um, and, you know, it's, it's I, I, saying it's a slap in the face is not the right way to say it, but just it's it's almost like, that there's that false hope that is sold to you, right? And then so maybe, and I'm not saying you didn't, but maybe you don't, maybe the person who's transitioning doesn't try as hard or prepare as much because they think it's going to be an easy transition. And, um, you know, you hit definitely all the wickets and um, you know, saw the difficulty too. And, you know, I work on Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton right now and um, deal with a lot with the transitioning Marines and and service members. And, um, it's the same thing, you know, now they have this program called skill bridge, um, where, you know, it's an opportunity to go work for a company as an intern and still get your military pay and then hopefully get employment afterwards. It's kind of, it's kind of the solution to what happened to you. Right. And, um, and still it's very difficult to get out and to get a job, um, not only just to find work, but then also, you know, assimilate into that new culture, right? So you were in the Marine Corps for 21 years. You had a certain way of life. You wore the same thing pretty much every day. You knew where you were going to go pretty much every day. And it, in, in a sense, it's kind of easy. But this this new adventure called civilian life is difficult, right? And it's, it's not as easy. And um, the culture piece is is big too. So, tell us a little bit about what it was like when you did step out of uniform and into this new company. What it was like 
getting into that new culture of the of the civilian world. Well, interestingly, when I did get that that first job, it it was at Marine Corps Systems Command, but I changed careers. So I did communications for 21 years, but in my three year tour as a project officer at Marine Corps Systems Command, I started getting into project scheduling. And I remember we had a contractor that was doing the schedules for the the project that I had taken over when I got there, and this is where my, my, my technical brain would, would look at the schedule that that contractor was maintaining and the schedule didn't match my reality of what I was executing. So I took the schedule away from the contractor and it was funny because I remember the, the one of the civilians, the contractor civilian, that person's leave had heartache with me taking that, that piece from her because that was her job to do that. And uh, I, you know, at that point, I had a backbone, and I remember having a conversation with that that gentleman, and uh, and I basically flat out said, "I'm going to do what I want to do." You know, what do you? I mean, I'm I'm a Marine officer at this point here. What are you going to do? I'm, I'm taking the schedule. It is what it is, and so I took that schedule and I really, you know, I built it the way that I wanted it, and got really sharp with project scheduling, a a skill set that that to me I, I liked it because it's building out the network of all the activities and and the interconnections. So I really, my, my brain really lended itself to enjoying that line of work. So in that tour, I, I started building a lot of schedules. And then two years in the tactical PM shops, then I went over for one year to the commercial side that did all the base telephone infrastructure pieces that you had even more money and more projects going on. So then I started building that schedule out there and they didn't have a contractor. So there was no, there was no rub, but, uh, when I went to Camp Lejeune and did that interview as yes, I was getting ready to transition, the job that I had applied for was a project manager. And I, I just wanted to go there to be a project manager, but the hiring manager was actually looking for a schedule analyst to rip apart the schedules on the big, big programs, the ACAT ones, they call them, the biggest programs that Marco Syscom had. And a telephone guy, you, you know, just happened to be in the right place at the right time, applied to the right cert and had enough scheduling experience and had that caveat that I was a veteran, I was getting ready to be a veteran and they got to do veteran first. And uh, I was very dangerous with that knowledge at that point there, dangerous enough to, to land the, the government job. So when I transitioned, I went right back to Marine Corps Systems Command working as a scheduler on ACAP one programs and, uh, and, and just kind of jumped right in. I was intimidated because I was born and bred to believe that ACAT ones were just massive. And had all these moving parts, but once I got my foot in the door and started seeing the, the network of of stuff, and that's where my brain works. That I I can look at the system and I can see the dots and I can make it all connect. It just it just really lended myself to be successful in that in that piece. So that culture, I, I fit right in. It was a Marine organization, but I was bored at that point. I did a year and a half at Marine Corps Systems Command, and, and I, I I was sitting in familiar desks, you know, and. Uh, so I applied for another job at Missile Defense, and I figured, you know what, let me go to a bigger ACAT one now that I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. And I got that job at Missile Defense. So I, I shifted over to Dahlgren, started working Aegis Missile Programs, and uh, I was even more bored there because now I was, I was given responsibilities as a scheduler on two missile programs there, and they were even bigger, but I, I, just, I, just, I just got bored. And I was spending half my day trying to find ways to stay occupied. So I lasted seven months there and I was getting poached by contractor companies to do private industry scheduling because it's a niche environment. That's a small occupational field. And uh, I left the government completely to quit. And I remember people saying, you're, you're insane leaving the government. I had a civil service job. I was a GS-13 mid-grade. And uh, I, I, was, I was like, it's just not for me. I, I said, I, I got my retirement check. I got my disability. I don't need the benefits. I don't enjoy the job. I'm bored out of my mind. So then I became a, a contractor working at t FirstNet, the, the network that does the first responders. And I became the lead scheduler for at t doing that as, a, as one of their subcontractors and uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. I had my grubby little paws and all kinds of IT stuff. That's where I think I had a culture shock because I was leaving familiar ground. I was leaving a military organization going to pure civilian program office in Vienna, Virginia. And no Marines around, no service members around. And when I got there, I was a little intimidated, but holy cow, you know, if you're a mover and shaker in, in DOD world, it ain't hard to be a mover or shaker in the civilian world either because 
there's there's people who don't do a whole lot in, in our environment. There's people that don't do a whole lot in civilian environment too. And there are some great people on that team there too, but it's the same. I, basically, the summaries, the culture, whether it was military organization or civilian industry, the culture was really the same. You, you've got you've got top performers, you've got mid grade performers, and you've got the the people that are being carried by by the rest, whether it's military or civilian. So once I got that in my mindset that 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 I'm in that pack, you know, wherever I want to be, I could be I could be a mover or shaker, I could be mid grade, I could be the bottom of the pack. It, once I got that belief. I fit in just fine in that in that environment, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I actually still work the AT and T program today, even though I left it full time. I, I support them part time, and get along great with those folks over there. I just blended in well nicely with them. But I couldn't talk the way that I talked to, to Marines. You know, the, you know, certain ways we had to. I had to lose my vocabulary. You know, <laughs> I had to drop the the f words and the s's and stuff like that, and be a little more professional. Are you still with them right now? No, so uh, I in, in 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 an effort to protect my clearance because they didn't need a secret clearance to be over there, as my as my clearance was getting ready to expire, um, I decided that it was time for me to go back into the DoD realm because I felt like protecting my clearance was the way to go. So then I put my my US or put my LinkedIn status to open to opportunities, and as luck had it, within a week, um, F thirty five recruiters were looking for a senior scheduler to work on the F thirty five program. And uh, I'm glad I didn't know it was the biggest program in the DOD because I probably would have been a little more intimidated when I went to the interview. But I went to the interview and uh, I was very comfortable. And as I was driving back from the interview, I got the, the call from the company that I work for now that the, the government had given me the thumbs up to make an offer letter to me. And so then I officially quit the AT&T program full time. And then went over to F-35 and uh, I've been there for just over three years now as a senior scheduler working in the uh, F-35 program office. So you're, you're still with that program today? Yeah. And, uh, you know, unfortunately... What uh, what I what I jokingly say now is it's probably it's 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 all bets. I don't, I'm trying to pick my right words here. Um, there's a safe bet to say that it's my last job ever, just based on current health um, deals here. So um, it's it's kind of humbling in one hand, uh, you know, as we talked about before. I was recently diagnosed stage four gastric cancer, and uh, the prognosis around that thing there, I'm not a number, but uh, 80% of people that get stage four gastric cancer typically pass in the first year. I'm not a number, so I don't buy that stat for myself. But if I was, if I, if I'm playing the odds, I still have to keep that in the back of my mind that 80%, um, I could be part of the 20, but uh, so I'm very realistic on, uh, on my approach to that, uh, that whole prognosis that's out there. And how long have you had the prognosis? So, so my cancer adventure has been kind of interesting. After I retired in 2015, you know, felt like I was on top of the world. Uh, got colon cancer in 2017, and I was working at Missile Defense when I got the colon cancer. And as part of the the, the workup of, of identifying how the cancer was and what stage it was, they they determined that I had this gene that was passed on to my mom that uh, makes me almost like predisposed for cancer. My body doesn't resist the cancer cells, so it grows kind of rampant in your system. So it's called Lynch syndrome. So GI cancers really uh, plague us. So families that have a lot of people with colon cancer, people dying in their 40s from colon cancer tend to have this gene. And uh, it, it fell on me. So in that process, they cut my entire large intestine out in 2017. But uh, when I did the surgery, I, I was not transparent about everything. I took five days of vacation, had the surgery, got my large intestine taken out, and went back to work full time in the office, missing only five days. Nobody at work knew except for maybe one or two people that I was close with. Um, I, I was embarrassed by it, so to speak. Um, I felt like it made me a weaker person. Um, put that behind me, and then I, I you know, started working the uh, F-35 program. You know, fast forward to that point, and in December of 2020, just doing routine screening. I got my first round of stomach cancer. So December 2020, 
they had, my, my dad had died three weeks to the day before that. I was getting ready to go up to Connecticut because the kid died in COVID. So I, I had to wait for some period of time for, for the family to, to, to quarantine and, and for COVID to be not existent. And so to be safe to go up there to do a celebration of life for his life. And so he died November 17th, December 8th, 2020. I went and did a routine colonoscopy and EGD. I was doing them every year because I'm very high risk. And they found full-blown tumor in my stomach. So that stopped my trip to Connecticut. And that was stomach cancer um, adventure began. They took my entire stomach out in April, 2021. So that left me with esophagus, small intestine, the back door. And uh, my stomach cancer reached stage three so very high risk for a reoccurrence. Stomach cancer is one of the nastier ones that just seems to come back. And, uh, you know, here in January, ran into some major health issues and uh, ended up losing my gallbladder, which that wasn't a major health issue. But in the process of recovering from the gallbladder, three days later, my small intestines completely closed up. And so they had to go back in and operate and found four tumors in my small intestines. They thought they were benign. Long story short, it turned out that there was gastric cancer that spread into the small intestine area, and uh, hence the stage four diagnosis that was recently uh, that was really finalized in the beginning of February, as far as uh, all the pathology reports. So long road to get to where that's at. How is how is your family doing with this? Have they um, well, well back in twenty seventeen? and you had the, the surgery five days out, did you let your family know what was going on? Or was it really just your, your work life folks that didn't know what was happening? So my family, my family definitely knew I was open with them about it. But uh, as far as, as far as like my Facebook persona, and we put that in air quotes, you know, as we, 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 we do our social media presence in whatever way we want to do, but I really was very cautious about letting that word get out there and uh and even even in work i just felt like it made me appear weaker not as not as whole so i was very cautious on who i let know and even when i got the stomach cancer same deal i mean i i remember when i lost my hair from chemo back in uh i started so you know as as i got the stomach cancer first in december of 2020 my wife and i were supposed to get married in the summer of 2020 and we postponed it to the next summer of 2021 because we wanted to get COVID behind us. And once they realized you know, how bad the stomach cancer was, I was going to do chemo. Basically, we got married January 23rd, 2021. So you know, we were going to get married anyways, but we wanted to get married while I looked whole. You know, I had all my hair. I was weighing 210 pounds. And we, we wanted to have a good memory around the marriage, not have you know, bald, skinny Jason who looks sick and, and we didn't know what the prognosis was going to be. I mean, literally we're going into a, a uncharted territory. And uh, as I went through that one, I was open with my family. I reached out to my extended family and my cousins because the gene I was really concerned about them getting tested for the gene, but I still didn't, I still wasn't vocal about it at work or with my, my persona on Facebook. You know, as far as I, I, did, I wasn't transparent and I wasn't being my, my true self as far as that part of it. And I had a buddy named Britt Carney, who uh, I, I, I'm going to pick my words here, but I'm going to stay away from that conversation because I'm going to maintain my composure. Um, so he passed from kidney cancer um, about a year ago now, but he had a more open um, discussion with 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 people on Facebook about his cancer adventure. And so I reached out to him and I, I gave him my my story and I, I connected with him on, on a more personal level with that. And he really kind of coached me and mentored me and. That there's you're not broken. There's nothing to be shy about on this stuff here. Um, you're not any less of a person. So when I lost my hair from from chemo for that, when you know, prior to that discussion with them, I posted on Facebook my you know, me shaving my head, and uh, I played it off as this is this is a part of I'm making this decision of shaving my head, even though my hair was falling out in clumps, you know. And uh, so I was I was still hiding the fact that I had stomach cancer. I was I was literally getting ready to do major surgery and on full blown chemo and everything. And once once he talked to me about this and got my mindset kind of straight, I was able to kind of open up and be a little more transparent to it. And uh, you know, and and it didn't take away from me. When I got the stage four, this one here, even leading up to it, I was already very transparent. And now I I now I my life on social media 
and my, my personal life and my family life, it is all in sync. If I'm going for a scan, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm being very open. But the one caveat I have to that is we all know guys and gals like this. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a, I'm, I've got, I've got this, this prognosis here where I can, you know, the, the, the odds are not in my favor. I mean, I, for me to see 50, I'm 47 right now. For me to see 50, um, the, the chances are it's single digit, but I'm, I'm living for today. I'm not down in the dumps and I've got plenty of reason that I could, I could find myself curling up in the hole. I'm working full time still. I'm productive at work. Um, I'm enjoying life with my wife. We're getting out there. We're doing things because I make a conscious decision every single day when my brain starts to go into a dark place and start to say, what was me? You know, why is this happening to me? Why, you know, in just, just the dark, the dark space. And I found myself there before, but when I start going there, I got to pull myself out and say, today is going to be lived regardless of what I, I would decide to live it. I got to get off my ass and, and, and choose to be happy and to, to live today for what today is and not worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. And, uh, that's a piece, whether you're dealing with cancer like I'm dealing with and not a good diagnosis cancer, um, but whether you're dealing, whatever the problem is, today is going to be lived, whether you want to live it or not. You know, you got to, you got to, you played spades before, you know, there's a nil hand. You can, you can, you can have a nil hand in your hand and you're going to play the damn cards. You, you can't put the card deck down and say, give me a new, new hand. You're going to play the damn cards. And that's what I try to live my life with is uh, I'm going to live for today. I'm going to enjoy today and I'm going to, I'm going to live my best life. And if, it, if it's taken from me later this year, then, uh, then I'm, I got no regrets, you know? So powerful. And um, such a model of, you know, how, how to live a life to the fullest up until the last day. Right. And, um, really commend you. I, I mean, I don't even know if I can commend you, but I do about the decision to, to do this and to live openly and to, um, you know, be a good role model for all those people out there that are suffering in silence. Right. And you were too, at one point, and just to, to, to be open, accepting and, um, man, I don't even, it's it's hard to put it to words because it's it's just so it's admirable and um you know like you said when you get into those dark places and you, you decide that how you're going to live today right and um, you're going to live it whether you, you're 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 going to live today you know it, it's happening whether you want it to happen or not you can choose to dwell stay in bed and then and 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 go to the dark place or you can you can pick yourself up and it's it, it's it's ironic you, you think about me giving support to another, another individual, but even like this week, and I'm not going to mention any names, but there was a guy that I reached out to who was posting a lot of dark stuff on, on Facebook. And he said he was coming off Facebook and here's his number. And if, if, so I, I reached out to him and I, and I basically, I basically gave my, he knew my story because we're, we're, we're connected on there. And, and he even said, you know, very sorry what you're going through. And I said, you know, same thing for you, man. I said, you got to be open and transparent about your stuff. You know, be honest. But the key is, if you're if you're negative about the stuff, well, then people are going to start withdrawing from you. You know, you can be open and honest, but there's a difference between being negative and being open and honest and transparent. You know, you can have dark days, but uh, be vulnerable at the same time. You know, and I, the thing I stressed to him, and I, I think that coming from another Marine does help because he was a, a Marine as well. And I said, you know, if you're not happy with your environment, fix it. You you own your environment. There, you can't blame anybody else. You you make the decisions on it. And I gave my analogy of how I ended up in Florida. Me and my wife were in Virginia, and last year in 2021, they thought I progressed to stage four. So in October of 2021, I got a call from the oncologist while I was at a bar, picking up some to-go food. Me, you know, me and my wife were going to get sandwiches from this little pub. And uh, so I went there to pick up the sandwiches. The phone rang and I had a Walter Reed number on it. And I was like, huh. I answered it because I had just done a PET scan that day. Well, the results came back that night. And he was calling me right then and there to give me the, 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 the bad news. And, and I'm glad he, he did. But he called me. He's like, he's like, you've got a mass on your adrenal gland. He says, we have every reason right now to believe that you've progressed to metastasized cancer. 
And uh, said, you know, we got to get this biopsy and get this all figured out what the treatment plan is going to be. And I'm at the bar picking up to go food and getting this news. And I didn't go home that night. I told my, my wife what was going on. And uh, I, I did go home later on. But uh, I parked that truck there. And uh, I proceeded with no stomach inside of my body. And I, I had myself more beers than I should. And, uh, you know, I, and I didn't shed a tear. But I was, in a, I was like, my, my, this, is, this is the end of my life. As they progressed that adventure, they, they never were able to biopsy the mass. I was on immunotherapy at the time, and uh, so I did a, a year of immunotherapy after surgery. And the next scan I did in March, so I, I went with the mindset that I was on stage four on immunotherapy until March. And they, that's when they determined that it shrank. And we had a health, healthy prognosis. Well, in March of 2022, me and my wife talked, and I said, you know what? We're, you know, I want to move to Florida. That was always a goal of mine. Let's make it happen. And she was all about it. She's like, yep, we got to get the kids off to college and then we'll move this fall. And uh, so we changed our environment. I took advantage of the clean bill of health at that time. We got our happy butts down here and, and we, we made stuff happen. So uh, if I was able to make it happen, I, I'm a believer that uh, all you've got to do is just take the goal and transition that into actions. And no one can really hold us back in that environment. We, we owe it to ourselves to, to, to live our best lives and to make those decisions, you know? What has been the reaction from from your friends? Um, I mean, I mean, there's probably so many different emotions, you know, sadness and you know all the different ones. How what's that reaction been towards you, and and how how's that been? So I, I really believe that me being open and transparent about my my health on on my social media presence, which I don't even have, I, I call it, I am on Facebook, and that's it. You know, I don't do anything else. I've got my Facebook thing, and I. Usually I post food pictures and stuff like that. So I don't do health stuff on there, but for the parts that are relevant to health, I, I'm open. And what I have realized is, you know, I, I've always been an introvert by, by nature. I've come out of my shell and become more of an extrovert. My wife thinks I'm an extrovert now, but uh, that, that outpouring of support and those relationships that I've, I've, I've got out there I've got Marines that are reaching out to me that I used to work with from 10, 15, 20 years ago that are, that are wanting to come by to visit. I've got family members coming down to visit. So I've had to print out a paper calendar. I never maintain a calendar. I mean, I, I'm a professional scheduler, but I don't maintain a personal life calendar. But we have so many people coming to visit, and I, I call it breaking bread now. So you know, breaking bread with friends. So when, when a friend comes over now, I'm going to find some unique food to cook. And it's not unique because my system is very sensitive. So like last night, I had my, my aunt and uh, really, really cousins. My dad's cousins came over. So three of them, my, you know, my aunt and two uncles, basically, the easiest way to describe it. And uh, so they came over last night. I made, I made a big roast. And we hung out here. And, and uh, the day before that, I had another friend come over. And the weekend before, I had a friend fly out from San, uh, San Antonio, Texas. And I've got friends flying down from Virginia. And I, I, I feel like we're running like a mini Airbnb here, but it's humbling and it's, it's, it's touching because we're, we're having friends and family that are coming down to show us support and wanted to spend time with us. And I, I accept the fact that the terms of why this is all going on is because people want to spend time because I don't know what the future holds at this point here. And uh, that outpouring of support has it's 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 humbling and touching. I don't know any other word to to use to describe it. And my wife, who's been my my rock and my 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 partner in crime through this through the entire thing, you know, it's it's she gets to hear these Marine stories as Marines come over because she wasn't with me when I was in the Marine Corps. And as I as I as I break bread with with former Marines, you know, we tell we tell war stories, not war stories, but you know, our 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 version of our war stories. And she hears a different, a different vocabulary. She sees a different side of my personality that uh, that, that Marine comes out, you know. And uh, it's 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 great, you know. It's uh, it's it's sad that it's under these terms here. And uh, you know, I believe that you know, my, I, I've given my heart to God, and I do believe in miracles. And uh, I'm even when I go to the altar for, for prayer services now, I say I'm, I'm coming up for continued healing. I'm not coming up because I'm stage four cancer. I'm coming up because healing's already started and we're, we're praying for continued healing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic on everything. 
if my time comes, I've, I've lived a great life. And it's one point that I wanted to make on this, this thing here, our Marine Corps life. And I'm sure you both have the same mentality. And I'm sure a lot of veterans do too. You know, no matter whether you did four or 21 years or 20 or 30 years, I look at my Marine Corps life as a, as an entire life within my life. It's, it's this, this giant bubble of a life. I'm not that life anymore. It, it's, it's a part of me. But when a Marine comes back by and we engage like this right here, I get pulled back into that bubble. And when I go back to my regular life now where I'm a contractor and you know I don't wear a uniform anymore, I'm wearing a secret sweatshirt here, I'm back in my real life. But that bubble, that the bubble's right behind me, you know, and it's still there. It's a whole separate life though. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, but it's touching with all the support that's come out there and, uh, and just people coming by to visit. And like I said, that paper calendar on my fridge, I got a pen right near it and I can write down to say, you know, if you want to come down, the day is open. I got two guest rooms, you know, come on down and, uh, and break bread with us. And that's just a testament of, of who you are as a person, right? And, um, you know, as a, as a husband, father, Marine leader, uh, friend, uh, people just want to spend time with you. And I think it's just awesome that, um, you know, you, you can't, you, you could have retreated and you could have, you know, closed off and you opened up your house. And, um, I think that's awesome. And I, I think people just want to just get a piece of you while you're left here on earth. Right. Yeah. It took cancer round three to get to that maturity level though. It's, it's sad, you know, because I, I missed out some opportunities to get, uh, to expand my support circle. But uh, that support circle really does build up my my desire to live my best life as well. Because if I was isolated and it was just me and my wife and I was closed off to it, um, those dark days would find me. And uh, they find me even now. Like, like when I take a shower and I put shampoo and conditioner in my hair, I'm going for chemo round two tomorrow. And, you know, chemo round two is when my hair fell out last time. So I know that this this beautiful head of hair, <laughs> I joke. It's, it's hanging on by, by threads, but uh, I know that that head of hair is going to be uh, going to be gone and my beard is going to go and my eyebrows are going to go. And, uh, you know, I'm on chemo for life at this point here. So once my hair goes, there's a strong chance that it may never come back. You know, so I'm just I'd like to believe I'll come off chemo someday. But then it's, uh, you know, I, I, it's easy for me to find myself in a dark place thinking about it. But uh, but the support network really has given me. Um, the, the prayers that are out there, it, it just, it, it, it's so helpful. It's, it's amazing to me. And so I made a, a post on Facebook about this, this realization that people that are going through these kinds of things, be open, be transparent, get that information out there to, to your friends and your support network. Don't be ashamed by it. And if you know somebody who's going through it, don't be scared to reach out to them. Because I, I was, I've been approached by former Marines. I had one guy, um, Daryl Sc Scabina, Scooby. He called me. I hadn't seen him for like 15 years. And he said, I don't even know what to say, Jason. He's like, I, I and uh, that, that dawned on me that, uh, that that's a barrier for people reaching out to people going through hard times. They don't know what to say, but he still had the cojones to, to call me, not even knowing what to say, just simply to say, I don't know what to say, but I wanted to reach out to you. And uh, so I, on my post that I made, I said, you know, when you see people going through this, reach out to them. The only thing you you need to say is, man, that really sucks. And uh, the person knows it sucks and they're going to agree with you. You don't need to sympathize about it. You don't need to do anything more. Say what you're going through really sucks, man. I'm here for you. That's it. You, you, you bridge that gap. That, that gap is, is so hard to get around, but it's actually really easy to get around. How is your son doing with, with this news and, and kind of this prognosis? He's, he's definitely struggling with it. Um, the realization that, that, that the time may be limited and, uh, and he's in Japan, so he can't even come back this way here without, without sacrificing his goals. So he's living his best life over there and I want him to, and my, I have my help right now. So, you know, we haven't taken a turn for the worst. It's, uh, you know, we just, we just started treatment. Treatment can be effective. I mean, shoot. So, but he, he is struggling with the, the realization that that life is precious and it's not guaranteed to anybody. And we all know that life is precious. We all know that it's not guaranteed to anybody, but when you're faced with the reality that you may lose somebody and you know that, that you may lose them, that, that knock on the door, you can actually hear it at that point, you know? 
and he's struggling with it. So um, I think there's a barrier to it because he, he does call and we do have some difficult conversations about stuff, but I try to keep the conversations very focused on uh, on the positives. You know, what are you doing over there? Tell me about your stories. What, what's your experiences going to Kyoto and, uh, and Osaka and stuff like that, you know? What are some of the things that, you know, one of the one of the ideas of of asking you on here too is is hopefully that your your family will have this, you know, for once you pass, they'll have this to look back upon and you know hear the stories of your service and and things like that. Is there anything that you want them to know um, about your service or about this period or you know? anything that you want to pass on through this? I, I think that, broadcast? I think that the biggest one would be, you know, I, I love my family and I have a great family. Um, they are my, they are my support structure. If I didn't have them, I would not be this optimistic and this positive about where my, my state is. Um, I've lived a, a great life. I'm very happy with the life that I've lived up to this point here. So I think that the, the one piece that I would want people in general that are, that are part of my support circle, family and friends, to, to understand and know and believe is that uh, I don't have any regrets. Um, I don't even have a bucket list, man. It's 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 crazy because I joked before I got stage four, I was like, if I ever get stage four gastric cancer, because it was, it was a very real possibility, the recurrence rates through the roof, it just happened to, 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 to actually reoccur. But I was joking before that I would buy a Shelby GT350 if I ever hit stage four because why not? I mean, I got a great life insurance policy. I got a USA policy when I was still active duty for 30 years. And thank God I got that because it gives me some security blanket there. But uh, then when I hit stage four, I'm like, well, all right, now I'm, now I'm stage four. I don't really want to waste money on a Shelby GT350. I drive only a couple of times a week because I work from home. So instead, like this, this afternoon, I drove up to look at a jacuzzi. So we're going to put a jacuzzi out back because I got my oncologist to write a letter to say, you know, obviously for, you know, I could certainly benefit from a jacuzzi. I got no system. I go through gut issues and stuff like that. So it's not like they fabricated anything, but I got the letter now and my HOA is a pain in the, in the butt. They won't approve a jacuzzi unless you have a medical letter. So I don't get any benefit from a medical letter, except the HOA will approve an above ground jacuzzi. So we have a pool already, but I want a jacuzzi to sit in, you know, I want to enjoy watching the sunset with my wife sitting in the, in the jacuzzi. So basically the, the takeaway though, is that I have no regrets about the life that I've lived. Um, if my time is taken tomorrow, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a happy man. Um, I don't want to die in pain. I want to, I want to be a, if I do get in pain, you're going to see a morphined up individual who's just going to be, I'm going to be happy. I'm not going to be in pain, but you know, we're, we're going to get there. But, uh, um, and I know my, my, my place is going to be, um, up in heaven after that. So there's a life after this. I'm a firm believer of that. And, uh, and if, so that's the, that's the takeaway is I have no regrets. I'm happy with the life that I've lived, the lives, my Marine Corps life, my pre-Marine Corps life, my post-Marine Corps life. Uh, I'm very happy and fulfilled. Yeah, an interesting, an interesting, uh, you know, path out of uh, out of my adventure from the Marine Corps. You know, I never, I thought the the long road was going to be the future, and uh, I've got a great wife out there that we wanted to see the end game too, and uh, we're just being optimistic on uh, on life. But I'll tell you, the the the, the camaraderie from our, our Marine brothers, even doing this kind of stuff right here, um, I would not trade any of my experiences and. And even joining the Marine Corps, that, that that that's that was kind of one of my 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 best memories and the camaraderie that it's it's just unique. I I, I don't I, I feel bad for people that didn't join the Marine Corps because they they'll never understand that piece of it. You know, it's just uh, you can't even you can't even put it into words. But we know what we're talking about. You know. It sucks. But it's it's good to hear you um, talk about just you know no regrets and um, you know th there's there's um, there's solace in knowing where you're going after you're right and um, and it's it's cool to 
to have that freedom to be able to express it and to um, to live in it and to and to know it right and um, you know I, I was talking to my um, my ten year old and um, he was a baby when I got out of the Marine Corps and so he doesn't he doesn't know that life my other kids know that life and and me in that life um, unfortunately they have the the after effects of it right but um, you know, he was really scared about what was going to happen. And he's like, you know, somebody can come into the house, somebody can you know, kill us or, you know, something can happen. And I'm like, you're right. Like anytime life is never promised. Right. And in the blink of an eye, we're here and we're gone. And, but there's a whole eternity on the other side. And, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, as our circle of, of friends grow and the people that we know, um, the more death we experience. Right. And it, and for me, it wasn't really until my father passed away that I kind of had to look a lot of that in the face and be like, you know, this is a very real thing that could happen to me any moment and not necessarily saying, you know, being hit by a car or any of those things, but, you know, cancer or just illness or anything like that. And, and being right with, with who you are, your family, and and what's happening next, right? And um, it's it's nice to hear it's nice to hear that that reassurance. Yeah, and we we you know you, you you mentioned about some of our some of our peers that had passed. I mean, Kenny Lyons passed. Um, Jason uh, Vasala who took took his own life. We've had, we've had a number of our brothers and sisters lose their lives too early, whether it was self-inflicted or through through health issues. And I I really do, that, that does, I don't, I can't, I can't call it comfort because it's not. Um, I know that I've lived longer than some people. That's probably the right way to articulate it. I've lived longer than others. And there's others that that are going to live longer than me, but that, that, gives me comfort inside of my own body to know that I'm not being taken short. We know people that have been taken short. 47 is not taken short. You know, 47 is, a, it, it is being taken short, but we've had others that have it worse. And knowing that there's others that had it worse makes makes me able to, to, to accept where I'm at because I've had it better. And there's I'm not worried about the people that are gonna have it better than me. I just know that there's people that had it worse than me and I'm blessed to have what I've got. That's kind of the, so that's where I can face this and I can look at my prognosis and I can, I can face my prognosis without fear. And I know that I've, I've skirted death before. I mean, shoot, we had rockets and mortars coming down. I was scared for my life out there. I I just, so I've I've been scared for my life in in the past and now I'm not scared for my life and my life's in jeopardy. So it's kind of a unique paradigm that, uh, that I find myself in, but I, that, that, that helps me get through this is, that fear of death before and seeing our, our, our brothers and sisters pass. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, I don't know how my, my brain processes it that way because I know that not everybody can, but uh, I'm able to process it that way there. And I'm able to get through this that way. I mean, shoot, I'm even looking at trying to buy a boat possibly just to enjoy some time, you know, we, you know if my, but I've got to make sure that I don't do a big investment on things because if something does happen, I don't want to leave my wife with, with something. So it's, it's like, it's not the smartest decision, so we probably won't do it. But I'm like, that might be my Shelby GT350. You know, I don't know. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, but it's our brothers and sisters that passed before their time. Um, I I know that uh, that it, it you know I won't I don't I'm, it just helps me swallow my pill because I know that it's not unique. You know. You've had a good run and. It's good to it's good to hear you talk about it. No regrets and and uh, amazing stories and and amazing adventures. Jason, anything else that you wanna you wanna pass on or 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 talk about? You know, to capture on here for for future use. No, I think that uh, the the stories I wanted to to to, to kind of chat about as we talk through that you spark some some uh, some stories to come to to, to my mind. I thoroughly enjoyed doing this with uh, with you and Blake. 
And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on here and to tell my story. And I'm glad we did cameras this, you know, I thought we were doing audio only. So I'm glad I got my, my office kind of fixed up behind me real quick. And then uh, you forced me to shower earlier than I normally do. So uh, this is even better because then there's video with the memory. So this was an honor to, to come on here and, and do this. So I'm very, very thankful for uh, the opportunity, Pat. We are so thankful and appreciative too. Uh, you know, your, your time is precious, right? And we thank you for sharing it with us. And um, our hope is that, you know, we can pass this on and, and, and through your message, provide hope for others who are struggling in the same type of situation that you are. And it's, it's important, right? Telling your story and, and, and helping others. And I, I thank you for that. And I, I know it's not easy, but you're, you're a pretty special person to do that. And so I thank you for that. No, awesome time. And, uh, I, I, I enjoyed the camaraderie and, uh, and, and changing sea stories, but I, 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 I did think it was funny with that story with Master Manor and you in the, in the office there, because that's a very personal um, memory there that I've got that, uh, that, that, that it's just funny to even think about it still. So I was talking with, with Top Manor last week about that, like I said, because me and him are still in touch and uh, it was just, it's, it's just funny to know both sides of the story still and, and still be in contact with both of you, this, you know, years later years almost 20 years later holy cow yeah well thanks jason again um we wish you the best of luck you know you'll remain in our prayers and our thoughts uh you and your family if there's anything that we can do any any messages that we can pass on please let us know appreciate your time blake do you have anything else yeah, I do. Hey, Jason, whether it's uh, one, a hundred, a thousand people see this, it's going to help somebody. So we, we appreciate you jumping on here, man. And uh, God bless you, brother. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Well, Jason, thanks again. Have have a wonderful uh, night. I know it's super late over there in Florida. It's getting pretty late over here. Blake, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Um, and so for all those that have watched this and you know, I ask that you keep Jason and his family in your prayers. Uh, reach out to your friends uh, who you served with, who might be suffering in silence or uh, struggling with, you know, depression, PTSD, cancer. Just ask that you uh, reach out to them and, and help them feel loved. And uh, we ask that you also pass this on to your friends and family. And so if you see this on YouTube, please subscribe, please like it, please share it. And if you want to leave some comments for Jason in, in the description below, please do that. And uh, and then where you get this on the podcast side, uh, do the same. So thank you for the time, Jason, Blake, Semper Fi. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you guys soon. Cool. Semper Thanks, Fi. guys. All right, Jason.